Okay, do we have a remote for this so I can control my slides? You have to advance them? Go to the first slide, that's fine. You know, I'm actually going to talk about Parkinson's, not heart, uh, and you're right, the principles are the same uh, because it's all about healthy living and changing your diet. Uh, you already heard a great talk on drugs and the things that you can do from a pharmaceutical standpoint to help with Parkinson's disease. This is the advantage of Western medicine. You can go to the next slide, but I work in the world of natural medicine and we're going to talk a lot about that. So when we think about acute care, we think of things like blockages in vessels and Parkinson's disease and heart disease. You can go through these first couple of slides. Go ahead. Good. Go ahead. Uh, but the bottom line is we spend a lot of money on treating disease after it occurs. And my whole focus in life is to prevent disease in the first place and to give you some tools that are going to empower you so that you can make healthier choices. You know, we have a choice with Parkinson's. We can say we're living with Parkinson's or we're dying with Parkinson's, right? So I hope we're living with Parkinson's and we're making the best choices we can to live longer and healthier and happier. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, most of the chronic disease we see, whether it's Parkinson's or heart disease, is related to our environment and our lifestyle. And if those of you are not familiar with David Perlmutter's work, he's an integrative neurologist, I suggest you read his book, The Better Brain Book. Uh, it is wonderful and lots of good advice for you guys. Most of what we see is how we live our lives, the foods we eat, and so on, impact our physical health. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, you could click through these, please, because what they do is they outline all of the things that can make us sick. And you can just click through all of them right to the middle. And you're going to see things like exposure to toxins. There are many neurologists who believe that exposure to toxins is associated with Parkinson's disease. Uh, smoking, how we respond to stress and tension, staying physically active, the foods that we eat. These all go into interacting with our genes and our genes then will express disease or suppress disease. So the bottom line is this, you have your genes, but the genes get expressed by how you live your life. And your life is about whether you're smoking, whether you're angry, whether you're eating the right foods, whether you're exposed to toxins and so on. Let's go to the next slide. And you can just keep running through those because this is just illustrating the interaction of all of these things on the genome. So at the end of the day, you are more than your genes. Don't just say, oh, I have a, a gene that's causing all my problems. The question becomes, how can I turn off some of those genes that are leading to disease? Let's go to the next slide. So our biography, how we live our life, really becomes our biology. And that's our goal here, and this is what we do at my practice at Guarneri Integrative Health in La Jolla, is I have a team of physicians, MDs, and naturopathic doctors that focus on restoring health. Next slide. It's one thing to clean up the mess. It's one thing to say, I'm going to take a drug after the problems occurred. It's OK to take your medicine. You need it. There are great medicines. But the question becomes, can I do anything to turn off the faucet? Can I do things in my life that can keep me living healthier longer? Next slide. So I like to think about it this way. If you had a tree and the tree had a sick fruit on it or a sick branch and that branch was labeled Parkinson's disease, we can say we're going to go up and we're going to give that sick fruit medications and there are surgical procedures as you guys know. Or we can ask another question. How can we get into the root of the problem? And you can click the next slide. Let's go into the soil and see if we can fix what's happening in our soil that's going to help us stay healthier longer. So what is our soil made of? Our soil is made of the foods that we eat, our micronutrients, our magnesium, our chromium, our selenium. It's made of our physical activity, how well we sleep at night. Yes. 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 
Curcumin? No. Curcumin. I'm going to come to that. Let me get there. A very good question. I'm going to come right to that. It's a good anti-inflammatory. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just let that plane pass over us for a second. We're going to come to food and we're going to come to supplements in just one minute. So when we think about the soil, we have to put all these aspects of our life together. Are we overweight? Are we eating right? Are we taking the right nutrients as this gentleman is asking? Let's go to the next slide. So Albert Einstein, who's one of my heroes, said, intellectuals solve problems, geniuses prevent them. So in addition to finding a cure for Parkinson's, I want you to say to everyone, let's find a cause for Parkinson's, right? Let's get to the cause as well as the cure, because if we have the cause, we can spare a lot of people uh, from having this disease. So let's see what we can do on a prevention side that can help us to stay healthy. Let's go to the next slide. Food is your medicine. Start with food. And again, I mentioned my dear friend David Perlmutter, who's a neurologist and does a lot in the area of Parkinson's, whereas I'm a cardiologist. And I've learned an enormous amount through my work with him. Uh, but what I've learned is that what's good for the heart is good for the brain. No doubt about it, they, they are the very similar in their needs. So whole foods is the first thing that we need. Not food in packages, not food in cans. Nice whole grains and fresh fruit and vegetables. Let's go to the next slide. Food becomes information. What you eat sends a signal to your genes to either lead to inflammation or to prevent inflammation. Food can give you energy or food can drag you down. Everybody knows this, right? So let's go to the next slide. Unfortunately, too many people are eating this kind of food. Yeah, we're going to take questions at the end. But we're eating this kind of food and this food is filled with sugar, it's filled with simple carbohydrates, there's no nutrients, there's trans fats, and there's food additives. So the first lesson for today is I'm going to let food be my medicine and I'm going to eat specific categories of food and I'm going to show you what I think they should be and they're evidence-based. Next slide. So this one says I'm Coagula, the goddess of arterial plaque. I'm going to tell you guys I want you off of sugar. I want you off of things that spike up your insulin and then drop down your blood sugar afterwards. So sugar and simple carbs, soda and ice cream and cookies and cakes, candy, alcohol, fruit juice, that's all sugar. We need to clean the sugar out to decrease the inflammation. The latest research on the brain shows that the higher our sugar levels, the more dementia we're prone to get. Diabetics have more risk of dementia than non-diabetics. So we need to knock the sugar out. Next slide. Well, this is from the 50s. They're happy because they eat lard. And I'll tell you, there are some good fats. The brain does need some fat. It needs your good fats, like your walnuts, your avocado, your olive oil. The brain needs the good fats, not the lard. Next slide. There was a very good study done looking at the Mediterranean diet. Does everyone know what this diet is? Lots of wild salmon, sardines, grains, whole grains, fresh fruits, and vegetables, and very, very little dairy, and very little saturated fat like beef, pork, and lamb. And what the Mediterranean diet research shows is not only, and you can go to the next slide, not only a 72% risk reduction for heart disease, but an 80% risk reduction for cancer. So when you're picking your foods, I'm going to say lots of whole grains, which we'll come to in a minute, lots of green leafy vegetables, lots of low sugar fruits, things like apples and berries and peach, pear and plum. And because of the link to Parkinson's and toxins, I'm going to say for you guys, organic. And if you say to me, I can't afford everything organic, then I'm going to send you to a website called the Environmental Working Group. 
and you're going to look at what foods you really have to buy organic. They call those foods the dirty dozen. You don't want to eat those filled with pesticides. We want to give our body a fighting chance to heal. Let's go to the next slide. We have lots of research that shows, again, green leafy vegetables, good sources of omega-3, like sardines, wild salmon, good for the heart, good for the brain. We turn off inflammation when we take things like dairy out of our diet, sugar out of our diet, simple carbs, white flour, white bread, white pasta. We turn off inflammation when we eliminate those foods. And if anyone's not sure about this, at the end you'll write down my website and you can go there and download all the food handouts that you might need. This study shows significant protection against, against heart disease, the same research in the neurology data for the brain. Again, the brain doesn't like sugar and simple carbs. Next slide. This is the Hale study which showed the Mediterranean diet basically decreases morbidity and mortality 50%. So if you walk out of here with one thing today, you're going to say, food is my medicine, food is information. I'm going to go to the Environmental Working Group website, going to figure out what foods I have to buy organic, which ones I don't, if, unless you buy everything organic, and I'm going to start getting rid of the sugar and the simple carbohydrates. First step. Next slide. We can go to the next one here because it just illustrates the same. For people that are diabetic, I see many of my Parkinson's patients become diabetic because they can't, they're not physically as active sometimes. It's hard to burn off the sugar, it's hard to burn off the carbs, and yet the research shows that the Mediterranean diet with low, what we call low glycemic index, low white sugar, low simple carbs, improves all the parameters for diabetes. And again, going back to what I said earlier, blood sugar, hemoglobin A1C, diabetes is linked to dementia. So we really want to turn off that process. Next slide. So this is a list of foods that are high in their sugar, what we call high glycemic index foods. Things like candies and cookies and fruit juice and french fries and potatoes and chips and breakfast cereal. So if you say to me, what can I eat in the morning, Dr. Guarneri? I'm going to say I want you to eat steel cut oats. Right? And what kind of fruit can I have? I'm going to say low sugar fruits like organic berries, apple, peach, pear, and plum. Now I'm going to tell you in the afternoon, I want you to eat lots of green leafy vegetables. I want you to stick, and you'll see in a minute, with cruciferous vegetables, and I'll explain why they're important, especially in Parkinson's. Next slide. This is what happens when you eat too much sugar, right? It brings you up and it knocks you down. And again, it's not good for the brain. Next slide. You can go to the next one. So let's pick out a few, few foods. Uh, there are so many good ones. I'm just going to say this. If it is green, I want you to eat lots of it. If it is kale, if it is broccoli, if it is bok choy, if it is Brussels sprouts, fine green leafy vegetables, salads. Why do I want that? High in magnesium, high in calcium, high in fiber, zero sugar, zero simple carbs. So good for your heart, good for your brain, good to have a bowel movement, all that nice fiber and that magnesium is good for you. Soybeans are filled with uh, properties that help the eye, help the brain, uh, and they also have some omega-3 in them, which are good for the brain. Next slide. This is an analysis looking at diabetes and green leafy vegetables showing you can reduce diabetes just by eating, replacing all your white stuff with servings of green leafy vegetables. Next slide. Broccoli is a perfect one and broccoli has something special in it called sulforaphane. Broccoli is in the cruciferous family and it turns on, as you'll see in a minute, detoxifying liver enzymes. One of the Parkinson's hypothesis is if I can't detoxify herbs and pesticides in my liver, they're going to have a profound effect on my brain. 
So we strongly recommend lots of cruciferous vegetables. You can go to the next slide that look like this. Arugula, bok choy, cabbage, kale, radishes, cauliflower, all the green leafy vegetables you can eat. This, and we want you to use these in place of the white stuff, the white potatoes, the white rice. I don't want you on that stuff. I want you to say, I'm done with that. And if you say, but Dr. G, I have to have a green, I'm gonna say brown rice or quinoa, okay? So that's what I want you to focus on for your grain. I want you to turn on your phase one and two liver enzymes through food to detoxify things that are coming in from the environment. And again, you're going to pick those foods organic so that you're not getting the pesticides and the herbicides. Let's go to the next one. Spinach filled with antioxidant activity. Remember, inflammation is not good for the brain. Antioxidants balance inflammation. So again, another good green leaf vegetables, spinach. Shiitake mushrooms boost the immune system, your body's ability to fight infection. So if you happen to like mushrooms, think about shiitake mushrooms, inaki, oyster mushrooms. Do not get those little button mushrooms and slice them up on your salad because very frequently they have a lot of toxins in them. So cooked mushrooms like the shiitake mushroom is a good choice. Next slide. Blueberries, organic. All your berries should be organic. They are low in sugar. You can add them to your steel cut oats in the morning. You can add them to your salad. Um, if you have to have a fruit or a berry, we like the blueberry. Very good for the eyes, for the retina as well. Helps to prevent macular degeneration. Next slide. Nuts. For those of you who say sometimes I feel like a nut, right? I have to have some nuts. Let's get the good nuts like walnuts. Very good uh, form of fat. If you eat tons of nuts, they can become very fattening. But if you eat small handful of walnuts, they're called the king of the nut. Uh, you'll get all the good properties uh, from the nut in the walnut. Nuts are noted to have magnesium, manganese, copper, zinc, calcium. And you might say, where else can I get those? You can get calcium and magnesium from your green leafy vegetables, but zinc and manganese, uh, copper, nuts are one of our best sources of these micronutrients. So again, we're going to let food be our medicine. And if we go back to our morning of steel cut oats and organic blueberries, we can add some nice walnuts to that. Uh, and that is a perfect morning meal. You can also add them to your salad, you can add them to your kale or your broccoli, wherever you like. I apologize for the noise out there, but I can't do anything about it. Uh, I can't do anything. You know, you just say take a deep breath and keep going. So. These are the clean 15. These are the foods you don't have to buy organic if you want to save money. I'm into saving money, so frequently I'll say, okay, my onions, my avocados, you'll notice things with the thick skin, grapefruit, mango, asparagus. Uh, I don't have to buy those organic. But the Dirty Dozen, which are behind me here, these are the ones you'll find on that website, the Environmental Working Group. The Dirty Dozen, things like apple and celery and spinach and lettuce, we want you to buy, and berries, we want you to get those organic. So there's the website, and uh, again, it's ewg.org. If you decide you're going to eat animal products like fish or chicken, uh, you really need to know what did the animal eat. Is my salmon wild salmon like this or is it farm raised? If it's farm raised, it has many more toxins in it. That's what the research shows. This is from Science 2004, a great journal showing wild salmon versus salmon that is raised on a farm. 
So those fish on farms frequently are fed things like omega-6, which are not good for our brain. Grains are not, those kind of grains like corn are not good for us. So wild salmon, sardine, those are your good choices in fish. Next slide. Now I want you to pay attention to what we've done in our country with supersizing of food. You know, years ago, like this bag of popcorn from 1957 only had 170 calories. Today it's 900 calories, 600, 16 cups. So imagine people go to the movie theater, settle in, they have this and a big gulp soda, which has about 700 calories and about 18 teaspoons of sugar in it. This is why America is in trouble right now. And you know, if you're overweight, the fat cells hold more toxins in them. So we need to get you off the sugar and the carbs, get you moving as much as you possibly can. Next slide. Whatever it takes to stay active, that's the goal. And it could be on a stationary bicycle, it could be on a recumbent bike, it could be walking back and forth in a swimming pool, everyone to the best of their abilities. Even doing chair yoga, chair tai chi, all of these are possible for staying physically active. Next slide. Uh, don't worry about the scale too much. This says don't step on it, it makes you cry. Uh, scale's not the be all and end all because it doesn't tell us our body composition, how much fat we have, how much muscle we have. So when we check our patients at, the, at our, my center, we always check what's called body composition over time so we can see if you're producing muscle and losing fat. Next slide. You know, many people get on the scale and they say, wow, I lost weight, but the lady to your right lost all her muscle because she didn't exercise, whereas this lady here exercised and got muscle as well uh, as lost fat. So again, this concept of body composition to keep up with, uh, with where we're going in terms of our routine. Are we eating right? Are we exercising right? Body composition is a guide for are we heading in the right direction. Next slide. So I put this one in because it's important. Many of my Parkinson's patients have high blood pressure one minute, low blood pressure the next minute, right? It, it goes up and down. Uh, and many of my Parkinson's patients, when they stand up, they get dizzy and lightheaded. Uh, so managing blood pressure is important. One of my little tricks for that is I have people wear support knee highs. So just wearing the support knee highs helps to keep the blood in the right direction so that when you do stand up, maybe you're less likely to feel lightheaded or dizzy. If you have high blood pressure that needs to be controlled, something as simple as decreasing your weight will take the blood pressure right down. For every kilogram of weight you lose, every 2.2 pounds that you lose, you drop your blood pressure 1.6, almost two millimeters of mercury. So you can think about that. If you lost about 10 pounds of weight, you might not need a blood pressure medication. So blood pressure really responds to weight and to sodium, salt in the diet. So when you're thinking about your food, I don't want you to consume more than 1,500 milligrams of salt a day. And most of the salt is hidden in things like cheese, canned foods, uh, packaged foods, uh, it's everywhere. It's like high fructose corn syrup. So the more you can say, hey, I'm gonna shop around the supermarket. I'm gonna go to the whole grains, the fresh fruits and vegetables. I'm going to buy bread that I can't roll into a little ball, you know, real whole grain bread. Uh, that's what I'm going to, that's how I'm going to eat. Uh, you're gonna find your body responding. Next slide. Uh, exercise could be anything, anything again that you can do. Everyone has different abilities. If you can get a trainer, go to a class, uh, whatever, whatever works for you, try to find something. Uh, exercise also lowers blood pressure and it lowers blood sugar. Next slide. So 
Uh, this is all the benefits of any form of fitness. We usually feel good after we do it. Our sugar comes down, our blood pressure comes down, our form of fat called triglycerides comes down. Uh, we decrease our weight, we feel energized. So anything that we can do, and uh, over at our table that we had outside, we were giving out pedometers to everyone, uh, just so that people can start to try to track Maybe I could walk 1,000 steps today, 2,000 steps tomorrow, 3,000 next week, whatever is possible. Next slide. And if we can do some strength training with that, that's the ideal scenario. Some aerobic and some strength training, uh, least strength training three times a week. Next slide. Uh, this is exercise in San Diego, a uh, big rush to family fitness and people take the escalator. So, uh, you know, probably park in the first parking spot they can get to. So, uh, I just invite you to remember going out and doing gardening, being out in nature, uh, walking with friends, get, walking in the pool if you can. All of these things uh, benefit your health. You don't necessarily have to run to a gym, but it's nice to have uh, a guidance and a trainer or a stationary bike, a recumbent bike, whatever it is that works for you. Next slide. So the gentleman here in the front was asking me right away about supplements. What should I take? And um, I thought I'd put a few in here. Now I mentioned over at our center in La Jolla, we have uh, naturopathic doctors who are experts in uh, nutrition and supplementation. And these are the ones that we use for our Parkinson's patients. And I'm going to explain why. Uh, antioxidants, I mentioned earlier, are balance the inflammation in our body. So we do use antioxidants like NAC, N-acetylcysteine, alpha lipoic acid. Also, these are precursors for something that's really important in Parkinson's called glutathione. Is everyone familiar with that term? Right. So glutathione, if you take it intravenously, actually helps people to move and walk a lot better. The problem is it's not readily available and it's hard to get in a pill form. So what we do is we give people the supplements that help the body to make the glutathione and that's where the NAC comes in and that's where the alpha lipoic acid comes in. We use plenty of B vitamins, B6, B12, folic acid. Why? Many of the Parkinson's drugs increase homocysteine and that's a protein in the blood that can contribute to blood clotting uh, and brain health and heart health. So we use the B vitamins to keep the homocysteine down. Magnesium, which comes from your green leafy vegetables, uh, helps with another side effect I see in my Parkinson's patient, which is constipation. Many of the drugs lead to constipation, so I use a lot of magnesium and soluble fiber uh, for my patients to try to help with that. We check vitamin D levels uh, on everyone. We also prescribe CoQ10. Who's heard of that one? Coenzyme Q10 has been studied in Parkinson's disease at very high doses, 1,200 milligrams a day. We use the precursor called ubiquinol in our patients, and we give our patients other things like NAC and alpha lipoic acid, antioxidants, omega-3, everything we can do to support brain function. And we do that with the proper diet and physical activity. So that's what our naturopathic doctors do, that's what I do. We focus on how can we restore these micronutrients to the body. Milk thistle is important. I mentioned the link between toxins in the environment. Those toxins, when they come in, they go to the liver. Our liver is the clearing house for toxins. If our liver is not working 100%, we cannot clear the toxins. So we said, let's do the cruciferous vegetables, the cauliflower, the arugula, the bok choy, all of those things to turn on our liver enzymes. We also protect our liver with something called milk thistle. Now, I don't want everyone to 
go out and take every supplement there is on the market. I want you to come in and do it or do it with your physician under physician guidance. You know, do it the right way. Next slide. So these are some examples of soluble fiber. When someone tells me they're constipated, uh, I get them on soluble fiber and magnesium. There are lots of tricks that we have, drinking more water, but these are some good forms of soluble fiber. These are low on the glycemic index, which we talked about earlier. Next slide. What about probiotics? Probiotics, you hear about all the time in the news. They're things that are po you, you may recognize the name acidophilus. Who knows that name, right? So acidophilus is an example of a probiotic. Well, there are many classes of probiotics. We are now starting to understand in medicine that the microbiome, the gut, what kind of cells we have in our gut affects our physical well-being. So for example, certain microbiomes are, exact, are actually linked to obesity, if you can believe that. So we are looking in the future at changing people's microbiomes. And one of the ways we can do that is through the use of probiotics. Not all probiotics are the same. Uh, they should be done with a physician or naturopathic doctor who understands how to use them. But what do they do? Let me just show you a few studies here. Go to the next slide. This was a study looking at insulin sensitivity in people that were given L-acidophilus. And what they found was if people took the L-acidophilus, it improved their blood sugar levels. Oh, you might say, I would never think that a probiotic would help with my blood sugar. And it did. Uh, this is another probiotic called VSL number three, which has been shown to put ulcerative colitis into remission. And for people that have ulcerative colitis, this is a devastating disease. This probiotic, 85% of the people were in remission one year later. And we now know as physicians, if we give someone antibiotics, we have to give probiotics to prevent things like C. difficile. So I invite you to talk to your physician about taking probiotics. Next slide. You can go to the next one. Omega-3s are good for the brain. I mentioned that earlier. You know, your brain cells are made of cholesterol, right? Sometimes people say cholesterol's bad, cholesterol's bad. Cholesterol's not bad. It's what happens to the cholesterol in the lining of the blood vessel that's the problem. The brain is actually made of cholesterol, and omega-3s are important for the brain. Uh, that's things like fish oil. Who's heard of fish oil, right? And when we prescribe it, we prescribe it with something called GLA because most, most people don't realize the omega-3s have to be mixed in a certain ratios. And it's important, again, to know what you're doing in this area. Triglycerides also come down. That's the form of fat that comes from sugar, comes down when we take the omega-3s. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, I'll skip this one on cholesterol, uh, unless you guys are concerned about it. There are lots of natural supplements like red yeast rice to lower cholesterol. We use fiber. We use lots of different things in our practice. Next slide. You can go to the next one. So when we think of anti-inflammatory botanicals, you know, I said that the brain is on fire. When we have dementia, when we, the brain is literally uh, pro-inflammatory, just like arthritis in a joint or the heart. So we have to turn that fire off. We have to take down the inflammation. So you can do it with things like green tea turmeric, ginger. So when you say, what kind of spices does Dr. G want me to use? I'm gonna say ginger and holy basil and turmeric, rosemary. Drink green tea, that's a great anti-inflammatory. And then there are many anti-inflammatories that we use uh, based on uh, prescription uh, guidance. And honestly, again, I, want, I really want you to do this with someone who knows what they're doing. 
this is to the gentleman's point here. He said, what about curcumin? Uh, this is a study on my left showing marked reductions in blood sugar in hemoglobin A1C, which is the three-month test for blood sugar, and people taking curcumin 500 milligrams twice a day. But now I don't want you to say I'm just going to take the supplement and continue to eat the popcorn, right? I want you to get rid of the white stuff and the simple carbs, and I want you to take the supplement. Next slide. CoQ10, important for the heart, important for the brain. Uh, you all know about the one study in Parkinson's patients at 1,200 milligrams a day. Ubiquinol is a precursor for CoQ10. Uh, that's what we use in our practice. Uh, this is a study showing for the heart, it's even more important than a blood test called BNP in predicting, uh, in predicting mortality. So CoQ10 has become an important player for both heart and brain. Next slide. Uh, this is a study that was came out in 2013 looking at CoQ10 in people with congestive heart failure, 100 milligrams three times a day, uh, showing improvements all across the board in morbidity and mortality. And I have to tell you, any of my Parkinson's patients are on ubiquinol, every one of them. Next slide. Uh, magnesium. If your magnesium is low, your blood pressure is high. I said I use magnesium for people who are constipated. I use magnesium for people with high blood pressure. I use magnesium in my diabetics. So when magnesium is low, blood sugar is high, you can go the next one. And when magnesium is low, blood pressure is high. So magnesium is a mainstay. And again, I said we can get it from green leafy vegetables, but we also supplement with it. And many of the Parkinson's medications cause constipation, so we need some solutions for that. And the magnesium is one of those solutions. Next slide. Uh, stress, key ingredients. You know, stress uh, was defined many years ago by a doctor named Hans Salye. He said it's a state one experiences that when there is a mismatch between demands, what's given to us, and our ability to cope. I, I'm going to shorten this piece to say to everyone, stress makes you sick. Does everyone believe that? Yes. Yeah. Stress raises your blood pressure. Stress causes your coronaries to constrict. It scrambles your thoughts. You can't make good decisions. Uh, so please find a path to inner peace that resonates with you. That path may be prayer. It may be meditation. It may be chanting a sacred word or saying a sacred word over and over in your mind. But find something that gets you to that path of inner peace so that when life throws you a curveball, you don't respond by producing all the stress hormones. Let's go to the next slide. This is the best way I can put it. Hit, you can scroll now. There's initiating events in our life. Everyone has events. No one is spared. Right? So it's good and it's bad and it's day and it's night and this is, this is the school of life that we're all in right now. So you have an initiating event but it's our perception, you can go to the next slide, and our response to that event that either triggers all the stress hormones or not. So you can go to the next one. So I just want you to think about that for a second. Two people can see the same exact thing and have a different response. So for example, if our foot is on the gas pedal all the time and we're producing stress hormones, we end up with high blood pressure. We end up being fat. Cortisol will make you fat. So our cholesterol goes up. We get heart arrhythmias. What else happens with stress? You guys know this. Do you get headaches from stress? Tired. You get tired, absolutely. You feel exhausted. Uh, do you think clearly when you're under stress? No, usually not. So, so many things are affected in our mind and our body when we're under stress. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, many, many studies. This was one of my favorites showing that when England lost to Argentina for the World Cup, there was a 25% increase in heart attacks that day, right? This is like Super Bowl Sunday. Let's go to the next slide. 
anger, the worst emotion for our heart and for our brain. Well, you know, we use these expressions for the brain when people are angry, we say, he blew a what? Yeah. He blew a gasket, she blew a fuse. Well, think about it. their blood is boiling. So think about what's going on. If we use these expressions, blood pressure's up, arteries are constricting. All of these things are going on in our body when we're having one of our hissy fits. So if we decide that we're going to follow rule two, uh, rule three of today, which is find a path to inner peace, right? We're not going to respond like this and say things we regret five seconds later. Next slide. So heart attacks are increased by 230% after someone has an anger outburst. That's a big deal. Next slide. So how do we find our path to inner peace? And it's different for each and every one of us. For me, it's through meditation. For someone else, it might be exercising out in nature or being in their garden, right? For so another person, it might be meditation or prayer or guided imagery. When we work with our patients over at Pacific Pearl, uh, we find what works for you. It's not what works for us. It's what works for you in terms of your nutrition, your supplements. We're here to be your coaches, but ultimately transformation requires one key word, practice. I'm giving you a lot of information very quickly today, but the key is practice is what ultimately leads to transformation. Practice in the way we change our diet, practice gratefulness, practicing appreciation, journaling, changing the way our mind works, what we're thinking, that doesn't happen overnight. Every day we have to work on it. Let's go to the next slide. So when we get back to where we are here, you can run through these again, and life throws you a curveball, some initiating event, you don't look like this guy in the picture who looks like he's ready to have a heart attack, right? Uh, we have to change our perception. Next slide. And that's my favorite perception slide because it's a perfect illustration of two people having the same exact experience uh, and, and really responding quite differently. Uh, this guy will probably be our patient on Monday morning. Next slide. So a path to peace. Here's my simplest path. You can run through these slides. When you feel anxious or stressed, the first thing I want you to do is focus on something we have with us 24-7. What is that? The breath. Breathe. This guy's got it. Not only does he know about curcumin, but he knows about the breath. So we start to breathe. Five seconds in, five seconds out. Right? It starts to calm the body down. And if you want to go even deeper, you say four seconds in and seven seconds out. And the minute you start breathing, four seconds in and seven seconds out, you'll feel your body go into a state of relaxation and know what's happening on the inside. Your blood pressure is going down. Your heart rate is going down. Right? You're, giving, you're putting your body in a place to heal instead of to keep fighting like the saber-toothed tiger is chasing you. So we do something called the heart focus breath, five seconds in, five seconds out, or four seconds in, seven seconds out, and then we teach our patients to think about something they love or appreciate. Because very frequently our mind is on stuff in the past, right? Mm -hmm. And worrying about the future. Worry gets us nowhere. We can't change a single thing by worry. It doesn't help us, yet we all do it. It's like human nature. And we call it monkey mind. Our mind is like, you know how monkey jumps from branch to branch, right? That's what our mind does. It's on the grocery list. It's on something from 10 years ago. It's on worrying about something that hasn't happened yet. And the only way we can get control of our mind is to practice. And the practice can start with something as simple as controlling the breath. And I like a simple one, which is breathe in peace, breathe out tension. Breathe in peace. And every time you take your breath in, you just think peace, right? 
Or you can breathe in peace and you can breathe out love, which is really what I prefer to do. So you'll find your body relax immediately. Next slide. As we begin to practice to calm the autonomic nervous system, all of a sudden we think clearer, we are better at problem solving, uh, everything gets better. So not only is it a blood pressure thing or a heart rate thing that gets better, we become clearer in our thinking and in our decision making, we become more creative, we become more intuitive. That's what the research shows. So we have to find that path. Next slide. Meditation. Please, 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 if you're open to it, take a meditation class. There are many that you can take. Transcendental meditation, mindfulness meditation. It's available all over San Diego. And again, if you take the class, you have to put it into practice. Meditation lowers blood pressure, lowers blood sugar, and in the most recent study, decreases cardiovascular events 48%. So simple meditation, 20 minutes twice a day, will completely reset your stress or your autonomic nervous system. So if you have to pick some pearls from today's talk, you say, okay, I'm gonna go look at the dirty dozen and the clean 15. I'm going to uh, change the way I eat. I'm gonna get more whole grains and green leafy vegetables and get off the sugar, carbs, and the liquid calories, soda, fruit juice, and alcohol. I'm gonna find a physical activity that I can do. I'm going to find a naturopathic doctor or an MD like myself that can talk to me about the right supplements. Uh, I'm going to get the information that I need to empower myself. Today's theme is take the next step, right? This is the next step. It's one thing to take your pills. It's another thing to say, I'm not having that white bread anymore. I'm off that white rice. I'm getting rid of this alcohol. And I'm going to start to heal my body. And you can heal your body. Next slide. Meditation, reductions in insulin and blood sugar. Next slide. You can run through these. Reductions in blood pressure. And then a 48% reduction in heart attack, stroke, and sudden death. So I invite you to look at every day, what can I do for body, mind, and spirit? Am I eating right? Am I trying to do some physical activity? Am I getting a good night's sleep? Am I taking the right supplements? For your mind, am I, am I not angry? Am I not hostile? Am I working on these things? Am I doing my breathing? Am I uh, changing my autonomic nervous system? And spirit, what am I doing to fulfill my purpose in this life? What gives me joy? Uh, these are, this is the essence of being human. And every day we have to say, we're living with Parkinson's, right? We're not dying with Parkinson's. We're taking a step toward living. And that's, that's for me the goal for my patients. Next slide. So these are our websites. Please feel free to go on and download our handouts. Look at our educational material. Uh, there's food lists for glycemic index, Mediterranean diet, it's all there, it's all for free. Uh, and I wish you all of the blessings in the world. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions, absolutely. Go ahead. Questions? This guy's been burning with a question. Go for it. Yeah, I've got a friend of mine that's doing the genome for uh, insulation. They're mapping the entire human genome for yes. runners and information and that kind of stuff. And I'd like to introduce you to him. Um, I have a lot of questions about your general practice and if I can get on your cards, I'll get out of here and everybody else.
I have a couple of my colleagues here. They can raise their hand. They're sitting right here. They'll help you with anything that you need. Dr. Moira Fitzpatrick is one of the most seasoned, amazing naturopathic doctors. We're blessed to have her here in San Diego. Uh, so she's, she's uh, sitting right there. So they'll help you out. He had a good question about inflammation. I want to go back and say what I said earlier. Inflammation is linked to food, to diet. We can take supplements for inflammation, so we can do lots of things to turn the fire off. Next, next question. Okay. I want to come in. Yes. And of course, the whole bunch of my green leafy vegetables are gone. How do I get around that? Great question. I'm on Coumadin. They tell me not to eat my green leafy vegetables. You talk to your doctor and you say, hey doc, I heard a cardiologist speak and say, if I have the same amount of green leafy vegetables every day, is that okay? And of course the answer is yes. What we don't want you to do with, because we adjust your Coumadin around your food, what we don't want you to do is say one day I'm going to be Popeye and eat all the green leafy vegetables and the other five days or six days I'm not going to have any. So what we want is the same amount of green leafy vegetables every day. We adjust your Coumadin around it. If you were to follow that Coumadin diet, and I'm glad I'm being taped, you would never eat a healthy thing in your life, right? So you need to uh, speak with your doc about adjusting. Say, you know, I'm having a cup of greens every day, or I'm having a salad that fits in this bowl, and a greens that are this big every day, uh, and your Coumadin gets adjusted to that. Also, for those of you who have been on a stable Coumadin dose, you can get your own Coumadin monitor. You can prick your own finger and figure out your Coumadin level right at home. And uh, it helps to guide you, especially as you're making dietary changes. And I'll just say this also about Coumadin. Anyone who's taking it, if any doctor gives you a new medication, like an antibiotic or something, always be sure to say, I'm on Coumadin, right? Because there's lots of interactions. Yes, question? Nope? Okay. Yeah, one more. Okay, we got two more. Okay. With a Which one? Phenagene. Moira, do you know a supplement called Phenagene? Phenagene. B, E, G. B, E, N. E, G. E, N, E. I have never heard of this supplement, Benagene. It sounds like a brand name. Do we know what's in it? My wife. I'll show you. Okay, show my, myself. Or Dr. Fitzpatrick is here. Uh, she's a expert in botanical medicine. She's standing up with the green jacket, just like your color. She'll help you out. Yes. One more question, Padres guy. What is the cool What's that? What is oh, Coumadin is a blood thinner that many people are taking because they either have atrial fibrillation, artificial heart valves, and people, when they're on it, are told not to eat any greens uh, because, it, because it can affect the Coumadin level, the vitamin K. And so uh, what we were talking about is adjusting the diet around that. Yes, ma'am. So I wonder if you could uh, anything about that affects digestion, and if so, do you recommend enzymes or something else? Yes, so part of the question is uh, medication related, and uh, Parkinson's and digestion, uh, lots of things can occur. Uh, I'm going to walk you through a few. First we say, what is the cause of the digestion? indigestion. Does it have to do with the ability of the smooth muscle and the body to do what we call peristalsis and get the food through your system? Uh, there are medications that we can use to help that. Uh, one of the things I see happen a lot is people are given proton pump inhibitors, things like Nexium and Omiprazole, Prilosec, which turn off all the acid in your stomach. Well, when you turn off all the acid in your stomach, guess what? You can't digest your food. So 
first thing we do is say what's the underlying cause of the indigestion and then we might give you uh, digestive enzymes, we might give you GI repair agents like L-glutamine and if you have heartburn we might use a uh, certain type of licorice called DGL. So it really depends on what's going on with you um, and it's, t it's personalized to your needs. And if you've gotten a lot of antibiotics, you know sometimes Docs are very quick to give out antibiotics. Antibiotics change the gut flora, which is why we say take an antibiotic, make sure you get a probiotic. Because many people we see in our practice uh, have had a lot of antibiotics and that has changed their gut and now they have something called small bowel overgrowth and we have to treat that in a certain way. So uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. I really appreciate it. Good luck to everyone. Thank you.